So what about dating in LA? Is there a way to do that frugally or is, is, that, that, uh, is that even oh, possible? Oh shit, you guys have stories I could tell you. <laughs> let's, let's tell some stories. Welcome to the On Fire Podcast, episode two, with your hosts, Matt and Kellen. We aspire for this to be a weekly podcast where we discuss topics like financial independence, life hacking, frugality, minimalism, and living within your means. And if you want that aspiration to become a reality, we need you guys to subscribe, share this, and like our videos. And for podcasts, it's really important that you leave us a review, a five-star rating. Absolutely. So in today's episode, we interviewed Graham Stephan, who became a realtor straight out of high school and reached a net worth of $1 million at age 26 in Los Angeles, California. I couldn't be happier to have Graham on the show. He's truly an amazing guy. But before we get into Graham's interview, Matt, what have you got on your mind? Well, earlier today, we were talking about frugal dating tips, and mine this week is board games. Those who know me know I love board games, and going to your local board game cafe can make for a great frugal date night. It gives you something to do and talk about, whether it's a first date or just a night away from the kids. For example, here in London, Ontario, you could go to the Cardboard Cafe and pay $6 each, or go on Two for One Tuesday. Board games are also great for group hangs or double dates. Play more games. By the way, that wasn't a sponsorship, but if you're interested in being a sponsor of the On Fire podcast, definitely reach out to us on Facebook. But if you're slinging mutual funds, MLMs, or anything the Joneses are jonesing for, you need not apply. I know not everyone is as familiar with the idea of financial independence or retiring early. Where should people start if this idea is new to them or they think they'll never be able to retire? Any thoughts, Kellen? Well, Mr. Money Mustache has got a very popular article called The Shockingly Simple Math Behind Early Retirement. He dives into the numbers and shows how anyone can retire in 5-10 to ten years if they cut their expenses and invest the savings. He talks about how the most important thing to note is that cutting your spending rate is much more powerful than increasing your income. Well, I can't wait any longer. Let's just dive into the interview with the man himself, Graham Stephan. So, welcoming to the On Fire podcast is Graham Stephan. Graham was born in Santa Monica and moved to West Hollywood, where he became a real estate agent straight out of high school and purchased three rental properties by the age of 22. Since 2008, Graham has sold over $100 million of real estate and became a millionaire by the age of 26. But don't judge a book by its cover. Graham is a down-to-earth guy and is actually planning on moving into a duplex to reduce his living expenses. And on his Instagram and Snapchat, we saw him fly up to London, Ontario for free using points that he earned by churning credit cards, complete with free meals, as well as starting price matching battles between Home Depot and Lowe's. <laughs> so welcome to the awesome. podcast, Graham. What an introduction. <laughs> so we kind of want to just jump right in and get back to your roots. So take us back to the very beginning. How did you first discover financial independence, retire early community? Um, I actually think it was through Reddit that I actually found that and I was big in the personal finance subreddit and it became bogged down with so many like stupid questions like, you know, I'm 18, I have a hundred dollars. What do I do with that? Mm -hmm. And then I randomly found the financial independence subreddit. And then once I found that, it's like, oh my God, this is actually a thing. I can't believe people actually do this because before then I just thought like, okay, like, you know, you could buy these properties and get money and. You don't have to worry about, you know, having a job or, you know, worry about making money every single month that you get something passively through rent. And then I found this subreddit like, oh my God, there are all these other people that think the same way and who do the same thing. And then you learn about like the withdrawal rates and like, you know, people investing in like index funds and saving and reducing their expenses like to an extreme. And I had done a lot of these things before, but now I found a community of people that do the same thing that kind of reinforced what I was doing because I thought that was the only one. Income versus expenses, what do you consider more important? I would say expenses because to me it doesn't really matter how much money you make, it's how much you spend and how much you save at the end of the day. Uh, because I have friends that make like, you know, a hundred grand, 120 grand, and they're always broke. I don't know <laughs> if, we can, if I can swear. Or like, yeah, I, yeah, I, totally. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but, I, but now, now it seems forced to pass <laughs> No, yeah. Um, but yeah, they're always, they're always broke and I, just, I didn't get it. And it's like, you know, I, I have had friends that start off like 70 grand and they're, they're broke. And they get a raise to like 95. And I'm like, dude, that means like you could still do exactly what you're doing now and like save an extra 15. But they're still broke. And then they make like, you know, 110. And they're still broke. No matter what they do, their bank account's always at like zero at the end of the month. Yeah. And I just like, I, I don't get that. So I think expenses, you have more control over that because your income sometimes like, even if you're self-employed and you're on commission, you can only control your income so much. I mean, there's, there's a lot that's just out of your control. So at least with your expenses, you have total control over all of that, how much money you spend on rent and food and 
cars and going out and having fun. And yeah. if you need to cut back on that, it's a lot easier to cut back on that. And also, I think you save more money com- cutting back on the expenses because to make you know a dollar of extra income because you're taxed on that, usually you have to make like an extra dollar forty. So cutting back your expenses actually has a higher yield, in my opinion. So I definitely think you know expenses are more important. That's an extremely yeah. important point. Yeah, yeah it, it, you have to earn a lot more if you're going to try and keep up the same way you can if you cut your expenses. Yeah. Um, so you're definitely not struggling financially, but do you consider yourself financially independent? And if so, why haven't you retired? Uh, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I could, but it's just like, do I want to live that life? Um, of, I mean, it would be pretty minimalistic, to be honest with you. I mean, I'd have my place and, you know, I'd have, I'd drive my say, Toyota Prius and like, it, it just, it wouldn't be glamorous by any means. And that's not what I really want. I, you know, I, I'm sure if I stop working, I'm sure I could, but it's just not something I would enjoy doing. And plus, I don't, I don't really want to. I, I kind of think like, what's the point at that? You know, if you can just keep going and you know, getting a little more. So yeah. Well, it seems like that's you're fine. really passionate about what you do. So it's not like you want to just stop, right? Yeah, I think it would be different if I was working some like you know a McDonald's job and just like hating it and having to be there. So because I'm not doing that and I like what I do, I, I you know, can't see myself stopping. Yeah, that's great. So do you consider yourself a realtor or an investor first? Definitely a realtor first. Um, investing is sort of like a side thing, but my priority is definitely working as a realtor and I make the vast majority of my money from working as a real estate agent. Um, I, you know, compared with what I make investing, it's, it's not you know, sub- substantial from the investment income. But uh, yeah, a realtor first, and that's always been my party, and that will be my party for the near future. Awesome. And so a regular segment we have here is just called Just the Tip. Just for a second. <laughs> and do you have a tip to share with our audience? Uh, it can be anything. I would say just get in the frugal mindset. I think that's the most important thing because once, from what I've seen, once you start increasing your expenses, it's very hard to cut back versus if you just don't do it at all. Like... If you get used to living on like ramen in a studio apartment, it, it's very easy to stay at that level and be perfectly happy with it. But if you, you know, if you're going from like a five bedroom mansion on the lake with a Ferrari, it's it's difficult to cut back on that. So that's been something for me that I've always been afraid of, like stepping up to the next level. Yeah. It's like once you do that, it's like you're stuck there. It's very difficult to move back from that Mm -hmm. so i recommend you know while you still can and while it's socially acceptable you can just be a total cheap ass and you know live Mm -hmm. below your means Mm -hmm. and uh you know not inflate your lifestyle to a point that's you know it might be hard to cut back on yeah i was gonna say lifestyle inflation is like detrimental to anyone trying to reach financial independence like you said if you get a raise live like you did before you got that raise and now you're just that much closer to getting financially independent yeah exactly So what about, uh, like during this process, have you been kind of a spreadsheet junkie? And like, if so, are you tracking more net worth or are you tracking your expenses and budgeting? So I found, I think it was early 2013 and I think it was through the, uh, financial independence subreddit Mm mint.com and immediately I'm like, Oh, I can get, (laughs) and I put like everything on there, all my credit cards, all the, you know, everything is on mint. So I don't really do like a spreadsheet or anything. It's just all on mint. I track net worth uh, because for me, it doesn't matter how much I make or how much I spend. It's really just like what the worth is at the end of the day. So that's really what I track. Um, And a lot of it too is like, you know, gaining home equity and fixing a place up. And like, even though it shows on Mint that you're like, you just spent $60,000, you know, the net actually goes up. Yeah. So um, I really just track the net worth. And so I think that's an interesting statement that a lot of real estate investors struggle with. Once you've done these improvements, how do you value your property? Are you using just your experience as a realtor? Are you using an appraised value? I'm using my experience as a realtor. Um, you know, some people use Zillow, which I found like extremely inaccurate. Mm-hmm. I just go based off of what's selling nearby. Just my experience of you know seeing what else is on the market, what else is selling. I approximate you know what I can get for it, and usually it's probably within I don't know five percent or so of what it you know I'd be able to sell it for. Yeah. And so I guess you've already kind of told us that you are financially independent, but I think a lot of people would think California, LA in particular, it's impossible. Is it possible to reach financial it's, independence it's, and live there? It's possible, but uh, I mean, I've gone to such extremes to do that. 
you know, I've, I've lived like a broke college student for really the last like 10 years to the point where like, I won't go out and get drinks, you know, even for me going out with friends and like, I'll get an appetizer, but that appetizer for me is so painful. Cause I'm like, why would I spend $15 on this appetizer when I can eat at home? And my, my go-to meal is always like, you know, egg whites, cheese, and oatmeal, <laughs> like, no joke. And that's like really high protein and like really good. But like, why spend the $15 here when I could just eat at home for like two or three dollars? And I see that as like, okay, so I spent three dollars here versus fifteen. I could save twelve dollars. And it's you know, twelve bucks, but to me, like twelve dollars still has the same meaning as twelve bucks. It was a combination of that and having, you know, a pretty high income and happening to, you know, invest all of that and having to invest during the worst recessions that we've that we've seen. And so I've had this like combination of things that have worked really well for me. And a few of those have been in my control, like keeping down your expenses. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I happened to be in an area with real estate that was really expensive. So the commissions were pretty high uh, mm-hmm. and things out, out of my control, like, uh, you know, just happening to invest at the bottom of the market. And that really put me ahead. So I think it's definitely possible. But I think there are things that maybe are outside of your control that kind of work for or against you. Yeah. I mean, on that note, like when you're talking about buying at the bottom of the market, you had that experience. So you were in a position where you were prepared to take on the opportunity that the recession brought. What about somebody that wants to get involved with this with financial independence or real estate investing at the, uh, in the, the way the, the current market is like, how would you approach it? Differently? I think it's a lot more difficult. I mean, if I was doing what I was, what I did back then now, um, I'd say it'd probably be six years behind than I was from way back then. So that's that's the the hard thing about it. But now I would say it would just, I don't think I'd be able to do it to be honest with you because the places I bought were like, you know, one fifth of the price that they were selling for a few yeah. years before. They cash flowed really well. Um, I don't think I would be able to do it now. If I were to do it now, I'd probably have one third of what I have now. Hmm. And um, it would take me a lot longer to find the deal. Like the duplex I bought, it took me six months to find that deal. And that's like working as a real estate agent. So you'd think like, Oh, it'd be easy. Like, mm-hmm. you know, a real estate agent. You have access to all the data. And everything. As soon as and it like, comes out, right? You know, everything that's on the market and like, you know, you have access to everything and you know everybody and it's, and it's like you still can't find a deal. Yeah. So it took me six months to do that. And you were probably like, if I remember from some of your videos, you were talking about, you know, you were putting in offers like on like everything, like a lot of like low ball type offers yeah. trying to get somebody to accept. Yeah. Eventually that's kind of what you ended up with, right? Yeah. But this, like I wasn't submitting low ball offers. Mm. I was submitting high offers. Oh, I wow. was submitting offers that were like, well, because I can uh, fix it up and because I have this much equity, I, I can live with, you know, a smaller amount of equity and I know the area is going up in value so I can, you know pay a little bit more than I should have knowing that a year from now it's going to be worth it. Yeah. Um, but there's always somebody who's willing to pay more and there's always somebody that's willing to pay cash. And that's what I was up against. So I was right. finding a place that I didn't have to compete that just, you know, worked out. Mm-hmm. Um, so our previous guests asked our audience, how do you know when it's enough? When do you know when to stop? Uh, when do you stop grinding? When do you stop hustling? I don't know. That's a, that's a really tough one because every time you get to a different level, you look at you know the level above you and you're like, okay, I'm going to get to that. And then you get the level above you and you're like, I'm going to get to that. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it ever ends, to be honest with you. Um, I know for me, like, that too. yeah, it's like, even for me, like if, if you had told me this when I was, you know, 18, I would have been like, that's enough. Yeah. But then you get to the point, you're like, well, it's really not, it's not really because you're, you know, then around other people who have this and then it's, you know, well, let me just get there and you get there and it's, you're used to it. It's not, it's not nothing special to you at that point, and then you have to get more. So I don't know if there's there is it ever. Sounds enough. like uh, almost like a trade off because like we see like Matt always talks about you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, and those people are the people that are pushing you to you know go to the next level at all times, which is an amazing thing. And then it also makes you wonder like when is enough, right? Because you're surrounded by these people who either you're mentoring them or you're being or uh, they're being mentored by you. Yeah, no, that's very true. Mm-hmm. So I think it's the point when enough is enough is when you'd rather just, you know, do something else Yeah. than do what you're doing. But uh, even then, I mean, you have to feel so secure and and knowing that, uh, you know, what you've done is enough. I, I don't know if there isn't enough. But. Yeah. Well, I remember like with Michael Rosehart, he asked that question and I remember I was saying like, I, I mean, I'm not going to continue doing what I'm doing unless I'm enjoying it. If you're in a financially independent state, then you shouldn't be doing things you don't want to be doing anymore, at least not for any extended period of time. 
that's what I'd hope. That's what I'd uh, like to think. That's when enough is enough. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. Um, so what about dating in LA? Is there a way to do that frugally or is, is that, that uh, is that even oh, possible? Oh shit, yeah. you guys have stories I could tell you. <laughs> let's, let's tell some stories now. Let's, let's get into let's it. Let's tell yeah. some stories. Okay. Um, dating frugally that, uh, I'm I might get some, some hate on this, but usually what I'll do is, ah, oh, this sounds like such shit, but you know what? Fuck <laughs> it at this point. Fuck it at this let's point. hear it. Um, I because I don't like go out that often and I've, I've had the same group of friends for you know a long time you know I've used like Tinder and, and Bumble and, mm -hmm. and there's things like that it's just easy because how you know yeah. if you don't go out that often it's just like you know easy to swipe and stuff like that and the thing is it's like you have no idea if you're gonna even like the person by the time you show up like I've, I've showed up at places and been like I'm over it in like a minute like I know immediately and it's like nope but you're stuck for dinner and mm. it's like fuck now I gotta like you know, yeah. buy dinner and then, you know, the bill's going to come and, you know, I don't, I don't want to seem like too big of an asshole. Just be like, nope, we're going to split this. Mm -hmm. um, so usually what I recommend doing or what I've done, you meet just after dinner at like 9, 15. Hmm. Nobody's eating dinner. Yeah, nobody's not eating dinner by that. So like usually I'll just say, let's just meet up for a drink somewhere. Oh, uh, that's ideally, and I, I'd, I've had these places that were like, you know, happy hour drinks would so be like half price drinks until mm -hmm. like 10. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I suggest just that. So you don't have to buy dinner and you just get the drink. And usually what I end up doing is like, you know, instead of going to the bar and getting like two, three drinks, I'll have a drink or two before and then you show up <laughs> and you're already there. And then you take it one drink there and you just kind of make that last. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, usually I don't, I won't like split it. Uh, and usually the, the thing I found is usually, and maybe this is just like, if I'm really into a girl, I'll split it. But usually when I split the bill, nothing comes of it. I found that they're usually the ones that I don't split the bill. It ends up going way better and they're way more. We need a me. bigger sample size here. And this can be the thing. It's maybe it's the girls that I really like a lot. Yeah. I split the bill with. And because I really like them a lot, it doesn't go as well. And maybe the ones where I don't give a shit, they're like, no, we should go out again. And so, but I mean, that's how I do it. I just keep it minimal. And, um, plus I wouldn't want to be with someone anyway, who's just like expects me to front the bill all the time for like expensive meals. Cause that's just, I yeah. cringe at that. That's so painful. I think like a lot of us not living in California have certain stereotypes. Yeah. Do you think, is that true? Like, is that more true in LA than it is outside I think it of? Could be, but I'm not dating those people. I mean, usually it's, I, you know, the, the people I go for are not the types that expect like you know crazy nice dinners and like cool like going on helicopter rides and stuff like that. Just like a sense of entitlement, right? Like yeah. you're happy to split. You're you're ha probably be happy well, to pay for dinner if they're not expecting it, and they see it as like, oh, yeah. it's a favor. Thank the, you. The thing is this is that I feel like there are always guys out there that are willing to pay for meals and will go above and beyond what any other guy is doing. I mean, if honestly, if the girl's hot enough, there's going to be some like you know. 40 year old dude who's willing to like put them up in a five star hotel and take them to like master's steakhouse every night. So I think the ones where they go on a, on, on a date with somebody, you know, actually expecting, you know, something more than that. I don't think they're really out there to get it, you know, a free dinner and stuff like that. Because yeah. if they were, they're always going to be dudes out there that are going to buy them stuff. Great point. Probably in a lot more than I would be able to. Like if the girl really wanted like that new car and the new apartments, if you could find it like some old dude to pay for that in a, in a heartbeat. <laughs> um, so switching gears, what's uh, one of your guilty pleasures? I would say cars. Cars mm -hmm. are the, the one thing I've been in, into for you know quite a while, and that's and that's the one thing too that to me is just like this experience and and something that I really enjoy and the craftsmanship of it and and not only that, it's meeting all the people that are into cars as well. Same with like, you know, the fire community, there, there's the same type of community that's just as into cars and we'd meet, we'd have like weekly meetups or like, you know, every Sunday morning we'd meet up somewhere and go through a drive somewhere and it's a lot of fun and the people you meet in the car community often are the same types as like that are into like finance and business and stuff like that and real oh, estate too. That's cool. So it's a cool way to also meet people, but I would say cars and, you know, I, I try to be pretty smart about it, too. There are certain cars that you could buy at the bottom of their depreciation bell where, like, uh, I guess, is it a curve or a bell? I guess it's a depreciation curve. Yeah. Yeah, it's a depreciation curve <laughs> where you can buy them and then drive them for free and then either sell them at the same price you bought them for or sell them with, like, a minimal loss. Like, Lotus is one oh, of those yeah. cars you can you can buy, drive, and sell it for the same price. Ooh. Um, Acura NSX is another one. The Ferrari 360 Lamborghini Gallardo. Uh, 
Uh, That's actually an interesting hack, right? If someone wants to have a vehicle and it basically just costs them gas and insurance for a few years and then Mm -hmm. they can sell the vehicle for the same amount they bought it for. Yeah, this is the same thing. Like if if someone wants to get in cars, the old uh, 911 Porsches or the Porsche Turbos, like you can buy one of these cars between like 30 and 50 grand drive it for a few years and sell it like 35 to 55 grand wow even if you want to buy a bentley one of the things that people are shocked about is you can buy a used bentley gt right now for like 45 to 50 grand and drive it for a year or two and sell it at like you know 42 43 thousand so when you think about it you're spending like seven eight grand for you know two years of driving a bentley which is cheaper than leasing a car it's cheaper than buying like a toyota corolla you know a few years old and Mm -hmm. selling it that's interesting. So. I gotta sell my Hyundai Accent and get a Ferrari. Yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> Will you be able to fit as much much uh, renovation materials? <laughs> toilets? Can I fit two to. toilets yeah. in the back of a Ferrari? <laughs> so, what about where you live? Like, how much of a difference do you think that makes in terms of reaching financial independence? Huge. Do you think you'd approach it differently in LA versus what you do? In- yeah, I think you would need a lot less if you're to go anywhere else. LA is one of those things where it's like. Even if you have two million dollars, like that barely buys you a house in like a good area, and by good area I don't mean like Beverly Hills. Like I mean just like a like a an average area in mm-hmm. LA that you don't have to worry about like getting mugged right outside your house <laughs> is about you know two million dollars for like a decent not even a mansion. I mean you'd be surprised it'd probably be like a like a eighteen hundred square foot house somewhere. <laughs> um, so yeah, so obviously you need a lot more. Just, I think it's really just housing because everything else isn't too much more expensive. You know, the cost of food might be a little bit, but overall, it's not a huge thing. So yeah, I do yeah. think it's it's really important. You know, if I were somewhere else, uh, you would need a lot less. Mm-hmm. But I also think you know the opportunity in areas with you know uh, lower priced homes might be a little less. So I think you you earn more in higher income areas, right? And higher cost of living areas. So I just think it kind of balances out. Hmm. Um, so you're a real estate agent, real estate investor. Is there room in your life for non-real estate assets? Uh, I think stocks. You know, I, I want to start getting into stocks. I, I've been kind of wanting to throw some money in like crypto just because <laughs> like I see all my friends doing it and I'm like, I'm the only one who's not doing that. Uh, yeah. just as, but that's like the gambler in me that's just like, you know, fuck it, let's see what happens. So how would you approach investing in crypto if you were to... Um, right now, because like the Chinese, it's actually really tempting right now because like the, the Chinese market just like killed crypto and everything's like on, everything's like so low right now and I don't see it staying that I just throw like, you know, 50 grand in, in NEO and hmm. maybe another 50 in Ethereum or something. Yeah. I have a friend of mine who actually bought Ethereum a couple of years ago or yeah. about something like that and it turned... Turned about three hundred bucks into about seventy to a hundred grand. Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah, like even Neo right now, Neo was like thirty something dollars, and now it is. Oh, it went back up twenty. Hmm. But when I last looked at it, it was like fifteen dollars. So we kind of talked about your love of cars. What other passions do you have? I like making YouTube videos, and that's been something that's been really fun for me. And it's been like this cool thing because I, I, there's no other way for me to be creative, really. In real estate, I mean, you can, it's, it's pretty much like a cut and paste sort of thing. So for me, making YouTube videos has been a lot of fun. You could put your own personal touch on it and your own creativity and really what you want to do. So I really liked that. Uh, besides that, you know, cars um, used to be really big into like reef aquariums. So I want to get back into that at some point and set up like another reef tank. And uh, gym, I think is kind of cool going to the gym. I've uh, you know I've been out of it now for like two weeks, but uh, mm-hmm. going to the gym every morning has been something that I've really liked doing, and you feel better about it, and you, know, you start getting into it and seeing progress. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's that's what I like to do. So talking a little bit more about the YouTube thing, that's kind of interesting for a lot of people that are interested in, say, financial independence, retired early, having that kind of side hustle that's a creative outlet that maybe still has some potential to be monetized or some potential to earn income. Yeah, I think it just makes it easier and makes me justify my time because it's, I feel like if I were like losing money on that in the back of my head, I'd be like, "Ooh, you know, it's not as productive as I should be. Mm-hmm. You know, I could be doing something else. Um, I think it just kind of eases the blow of me spending so much time on it. Well, like but, how much value is there in branding too? I've yet, to, I've yet to find that out and we'll, we'll find that out at some point in the future. Right now I have no clue mm-hmm. uh, because I see some, some YouTubers that have, you know, hundreds of thousands or like you know one to two million subscribers mm-hmm. and they just blew it to shit and just like nobody cares anymore and nobody watches them anymore and they're you know 
they're a thing of the past. So I'm almost just kind of worried. I think YouTube just, or people in general, I think have the moment in the spotlight for like, I don't know, three to seven years. And then it's the next thing or the next new thing. Even with musicians, a lot of it's just like, you know, maybe seven years max of like a good career before something else comes from that. So, you know, part of me thinks with the YouTube, it might be three to seven years of whatever this is before it's, you know, the next real estate guy or the next YouTuber. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not expecting this to be a long-term thing. If it is, I mean, all the better. I mean, like Dave Ramsey or like Grant Cardone has been doing this for a while. <laughs> Dave Ramsey did it like 30 years. I'm so, sure you have a lot of fans that want to hear like, you're going to be doing this forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think there's a Don't point where like you have to just continue to stay relevant. And, yeah. and, and the other thing too, it's like I'm going to be almost growing up with the audience so you know i'm gonna get older and they're gonna get older and you know are they still gonna be watching um and then how do you relate to people that are brand new because that's the thing like i feel like part of the reason why people watch me is just i guess i'm relatable and you know i look young and some someone's watching is like 16 years old and he's like oh he he looks like he's 18 Mm -hmm. you know so they have a they're able to relate to me but i think if i was some like 50 year old dude people wouldn't want to watch just because uh, they have a harder time seeing and relating to that person in their perspective. Hmm. Uh, they'd almost see it as like, you know, they're watching their like mom or dad than right. they would watching like, you know, some kid. Mm-hmm. So I feel like at a certain point you have to like grow up with your audience and change with them. And you can't attract that, you know, young audience anymore. Gary Vee's doing it actually. So, mm. you know, I kind of take that back. He's doing it really True. well. Um, but again, I, I think Gary Vee has been doing YouTube really now for like two years, three years or something like that. So, Which is crazy, the amount yeah. of following he's gained in that time. Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll see how relevant he becomes, you know, seven years from now. But I really think that, you know, five to seven years is how much you can expect of like to continue to gain popularity and traction. So on that note, what are your plans as of today? Like what's your five, 10, 20 year plan? Do you have any ideas? Secretly, I just, I want to do YouTube. I like seek just because I've enjoyed it so much. I know that right now is not the smart move for me just to be like, I want to put all this time in YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, what is so, it you enjoy so much about YouTube that makes you want to do that? Uh, I guess it's just the creative expression. And um, honestly, I love watching the numbers and like seeing them improve and all the analytics. seeing the feedback and the analytics and like putting your own spin on something and putting your own personality. And it's just like, you know, seeing people enjoy it too. And it's cool to get these messages messages like, you know, I just got my real estate license because of you or like, you know, I just did my first open house because you told me to do this and I did it and it worked. And I mean, that's really cool to be able to have that impact on people mm-hmm. in a way that's not, you know, me like rapping, you know, like boats and hoes and, the, <laughs> you know, someone like shooting up meth or something like that. So uh, I think that's awesome. I've never had that before. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I've never, I've never had meth before. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> one day, but, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, a, I, I think realistically I would like to do real estate for the next, you know, probably decade. I can see myself doing it. Um, I'll always do it, but I think, you know, decade of just like really working hard at it. And then after that, maybe just being more selective with who I work with. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely. I want to continue YouTube. I really want to see where that leads. And I'd like to have my own thing at some point based off the YouTube. Um, if it's like, you know, some financial show or, you know, That'd be awesome. something about real estate. I, I just want it to be my own of, you know, renovating properties or buying something. Or, you know, I, I don't want to be one of these like, you know, big seminar people that like, you know, pitch the products and like, yeah. you, know, mm-hmm. you know, show up to my free seminar. And then, you know, when you're there, it's, well, come to my $5,000 thing. And then when you're there, it's come to my $15,000 private yeah. coaching. And so I, don't, I definitely do not want to do that, but uh, well, I think like you're bringing real value to the YouTube absolutely. community. So I think there are a lot of people that'd probably be interested in something like that. Yeah, and uh, I don't know. I also kind of believe right now that education is really going online, and I you know because I just kind of think what I do, and if I want to learn something, chances are I go either on Reddit or YouTube mm-hmm. to learn anything I want now. Um, so I'm thinking because everything is kind of going online. I really want to get in the education market online. Mm-hmm. And I really think that that's going to be the future of, you know, how people learn and, you know, grow and get experience. It's just online. So if I can get in that, you know, that's where I think the next big boom is going to be. Agreed. Awesome. Well, I think that that wraps everything up yeah. for now. Thanks for cool. being on the show, Graham. But before we wrap it up, 
Uh, we're doing a regular segment where you can ask our audience any question and they're going to respond on our London on Fire Facebook group. Uh, you know, the last question was Michael Rosehart, who retired at 24, asking, when do you stop? What's enough? What would you like to ask our audience? Have you smashed that like button yet? Have you, <laughs> have you, have you subscribed to Matt McKeever? Have you subscribed to Graham Stephan? And have you smashed that like button? If you said no to any of the above, look at yourself in the mirror right now and ask yourself, what am I doing with my time? <laughs> and take a good hard look at yourself in the mirror and ask, why haven't I subscribed yet? What am I resisting? And then go to your phone or your computer or the nearest possible phone or computer and subscribe <laughs> and smash that like button. That's a great question. I'd love to share that with our community. I can't wait to see the comments we get in the uh, London on Fire Facebook group. That's going to be perfect. Thanks a lot for coming on the show, Graham. This was awesome. Appreciate okay. it. Cool. Thank you. That was awesome. Graham's such a genuine guy and there's so much you can learn from his YouTube channel particularly if you're looking to get started on your fire journey. Absolutely, and I can't wait to see where he takes his YouTube channel. It's amazing to see how big his audience has grown from zero to 67,000 subscribers in under a year. Yeah, it, it blows my mind. It's fantastic, but he deserves it. As always, if you want to get in contact with us or find out more about this podcast, find us on the London on Fire Facebook group, meetup.com, or on firepodcast.ca. And make sure to tune in to our next episode where we'll have another fantastic guest. And if you think you're that guest or know someone who might be, definitely reach out to us. Thanks for listening. This is Matt and Kellen signing off. And until next time, remember, first rule of On Fire Podcast is talk about On Fire Podcast. <laughs>